So uh, my name is Ricardo Dolmich. I'm the Global Head of Neuroscience at Novartis. And today I'm going to tell you uh, something about the efforts that we've been making to try and develop new drugs for diseases of the central nervous system. Before I start, I should tell you something about myself. Um, so there are maybe two things you should know. The first is that I'm originally from Colombia. And so what that means is that my mom calls me twice a week. She's been doing this for the last 30 years. Uh, the second thing you should know is that I have a son who has autism. And so I've spent most of my career trying to understand the underlying cellular and molecular basis of autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So when my mom calls me, she often delivers what I describe as damnation with faint praise. And so uh, a few years ago, she called me up and she said, uh, you know, I'm amazed at how much progress you're making in autism. Every day you discover something else that causes it. And, uh, you know, it didn't feel like, uh, like success. In fact, it felt a little bit like this dog in this picture, uh, which is that we have the cookies, but we can't open the bag. And so uh, when, when, what I'm going to tell you about today is some of our efforts to try and open that bag. So our mission is to develop medicines that reduce suffering by treating diseases of the nervous system. And there is a great deal of suffering to go around. So depression. 50,000 people a year die from suicide in the U.S. every year. Alzheimer's disease. There will be 115 million people with Alzheimer's by the year 2050. This is an existential threat to our medical system. We will not be able to pay for those people. It will cost us more than a trillion dollars to take, trillion dollars to take care of them. Schizophrenia. Uh, there are about 3 million people in the U.S. About 300,000 of those are in prisons and homeless shelters because that is how we take care of our schizophrenics. Addiction. There are 30 million people in the U.S. and in Europe. In Massachusetts, where I live, there were more than 1,000 deaths last year, more than 100,000 visits to the emergency room from overdoses. And then autism, which is very close to my heart. Uh, about 1 in 150 children will require lifelong care, and we have no treatments. We have, in fact, no treatments for any of these things, no cures. So the question is why? And I should just say that we have a very proud history of developing uh, medicines that have improved people's lives in neuroscience. But uh, things have been rough uh, over the last few years. And uh, I think this is illustrated in uh, this, this study from uh, Michael Ringel and his colleagues. And, uh, what you see here. So they were trying to understand uh, what it is that makes a drug company successful. And uh, what they found was that, in fact, among all the different disease areas, the only thing that was negatively correlated with your success as a drug company was if you were in neuroscience. So of course, this is the last thing you want to hear if you're the head of neuroscience at any major drug company. And so one of the things that uh, we set out to understand was why. Why is it that drug development in neuroscience is so hard? The first problem is that uh, we select uh, diseases that we just don't understand very well. So uh, part of this comes from this idea that we need to develop blockbuster drugs. And so almost by definition, uh, any disease that affects a large number of people is not a single disease, but a whole set of diseases. And so, for example, there are many different kinds of depression and there are many different kinds of schizophrenia, and we need to subdivide those diseases into smaller indications so that we can get at the underlying biology of the disease. The second problem is that we just don't have very good preclinical models. So our preclinical models just don't predict whether something's going to work in humans. And this has, of course, held us back for a long time. Uh, the, the third issue is that uh, drugs in neuroscience have to be very safe, and they have to get into the brain. And they have to be very safe because we're mostly giving them to people who are comparatively healthy, and we're often going to be giving them to them for the rest of their lives. And of course, they have to get into the brain, which is something that you just don't have to do for uh, most other, uh, for, you have to do what, when developing drugs for most other kinds of diseases. And then the final problem is that uh, clinical trials in neuroscience are really hard. And they're really hard for at least two reasons. First of all, the patients are heterogeneous, as I mentioned before. But the additional problem is that the endpoints are really hard to measure because we're always measuring soft things like cognition and mood. And measuring those things uh, reliably without big placebo effects is really difficult. 
So if we're going to succeed in making new drugs for diseases of the brain, we have to improve in all of these areas. So let's just start from the very beginning. Uh, how should we uh, select our diseases and our targets? Well, in neuroscience, there are essentially two ways in which we've succeeded in the past. The first is what I would describe as serendipity. And so you may know about the story of chlorpromazine, which was the first antipsychotic. And chlorpromazine was never developed as an antipsychotic. It was developed as an antihistamine. And uh, only later did a surgeon in France, Henri Laborit, uh, first uh, discover that it was a sedative and started using it in his patients before surgery. And then he had two colleagues in psychiatry, Pierre Deneker and Jean Delay. And he noticed that they had very agitated patients, and he suggested that perhaps they should use chlorpromazine in these very agitated schizophrenics. And it was found that once the sedation wore off, uh, they also had fewer uh, psychotic episodes and fewer delusions. So that was purely, uh, purely serendipitous. This was the first antipsychotic, and then this led to a whole series of antipsychotics, each one of which was slightly better than the previous one. The second approach was to start with human genetics. And again, the idea here is that we, if, is that if there is a genetic mutation that causes disease, we can use that mutation as a way of trying to identify a target that we can use to develop a drug. So uh, one of the reasons, of course, why this has actually become possible is that there has been a dramatic advance in sequencing uh, DNA. And so the cost of sequencing a human genome has declined dramatically uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, in fact, the cost has gone down almost a million-fold. Uh, I don't know of anything else that has gone down by a million-fold. And so this has made it possible, then, to get sequences for many, many, many people. And it has led to the identification of many genes that either cause diseases or, alternatively, that increase the susceptibility for a disease dramatically. Uh, so there are essentially three types of mutations that cause neuropsychiatric diseases. The first are very rare mutations that are very penetrant. And so uh, by definition, if you have this mutation, you will have a particular disease. Of course, these are very unusual. Then uh, some more, more commonly, there are these low-frequency copy number variants. And though these are micro-deletions or micro-duplications of genes in, in uh, the genome. And they are often not... Uh, causative, but they dramatically increase the susceptibility for a particular disease. And then finally, at the other end, there are these common single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are things that we all share, and they can uh, slightly increase our risk for particular diseases. And the thought is that combinations of these three things can lead to disease. So the model is sort of illustrated here, which is that uh, everybody has these single nucleotide polymorphisms that provide our genetic background, and then superimposed on them are these copy number variants and rare mutations, and they tilt the balance until we have a disease. So this all sounds great. Now the question is, how do we go from these genes to uh, a behavior and ultimately to a drug that can change that behavior? So conceptually, it's very straightforward. You have a mutation in a gene, and that mutation in a gene in turn changes the, changes the structure of a protein that then changes the function of a cell. And that in turn changes the function of a circuit that changes behavior. Sounds easy. Uh, it turns out to be really difficult to make the link between all these different levels. So, uh, so the standard approach, really, over the last 20 years has been to make a mouse. You identify a mutation in a human, and then you introduce that mutation into a mouse. And you take that mouse, and you study it. And in fact, we've learned a great deal about how to make, uh, about disease and about the underlying basis of many biological processes by studying mutant mice. At the same time, we've also learned that uh, there are, that mouse models, especially of neuropsychiatric diseases, are just not very predictive of what's going to happen in humans. And uh, the reason is, is, is sort of illustrated here, right? Uh, uh, it, Turns out that if you're uh, looking at a mouse, it's very diff difficult to distinguish a schizophrenic from a bipolar mouse, from a depressed mouse, from an anxious mouse, from an autistic mouse, from a mouse with ADHD or cognitive impairment, or from a high-functioning mouse. You know, all mice are sort of cognitively impaired. That's what it means to be a mouse. So as a consequence, uh, it's uh, not surprising that our ability to model these diseases preclinically in mice is very limited. Uh, and so this has led us to try and look for other approaches that we can use to try and model diseases preclinically. 
So mice aren't great models for many neurological and psychiatric diseases. And of course, one of the reasons for that is that we diverged about 60 million years ago. And of course, many things have changed uh, between mice and, and humans. Uh, now, uh, that's not to say that they're completely worthless. Uh, I think that we've, uh, as I said before, we've learned a lot about the underlying basis of uh, many physiological processes by studying mice. However, what we can say is this, that the further away you get from a mutation, the less predictive the model becomes. And uh, sort of the, the, the reason that that's true is that a mutation often changes the biochemistry of a cell. And if you're looking for a drug that changes the biochemistry, it is much more likely to work in a human because that is likely to be conserved. As you go further away from the mutation and you now start to study the function of a circuit or the behavior of the mouse, that is much less likely to be predictive. And so I think many of the mistakes that we've made in the past in developing drugs is if we've relied, for example, on behavior as a way of trying to develop a drug. And that, in fact, has turned out not to work. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to develop drugs for humans using humans. The problem is that in neuroscience, we can't take biopsies of people's brains. Most people don't want a hole drilled into their head so we can remove some of their neurons. Uh, I often tell people that I'm very jealous of my colleagues in cancer because uh, they have this ability to look at biopsies from tumors that behave to a first approximation in the lab the way they behave in a patient. Uh, we don't have that. So the next best idea was if we couldn't get a biopsy, maybe we could make one. So for a long time, this was a pipe dream, right? How are you going to make a biopsy from a patient with some sort of a genetic disease? Uh, and what really changed was that uh, in around 2006, uh, a Japanese group led by Shinya Yamanaka developed what was really a revolutionary technology. And the underlying idea is sort of illustrated here. So we start off by harvesting skin cells or blood cells from a patient. And then, and this is where the magic comes in, we can take these cells, which are completely 100% specialized to be skin or blood, and we can convert them into stem cells. And these are pluripotent stem cells that have the capacity to make any other cell in your body. And then we can convert those stem cells into neurons, and then we can identify some defect in those cells, some phenotype that then allows us to develop a drug that changes that phenotype. And so the advantage that this has is that, first of all, we're studying human neurons with all the uh, things that make humans human. And in addition to this, because it's a cellular phenotype, it means that the uh, rate at which we can optimize a compound is much faster than it would be if we had to keep injecting them into a mouse or some other animal. So that's what we've started doing and we've been doing for about a decade. Um, so the first step in this is to uh, start by reprogramming, uh, stem, uh, reprogramming somatic cells to generate stem cells. And so how do we do that? And so the approach is illustrated here. We start with cells that are sort of elongated like this. They're, they're fibroblasts. And then we introduce these factors that change the structure of the DNA. And they essentially alter the folding in such a way that the genome is no longer producing the proteins that are required to make a fibroblast. They're now producing the proteins that are required to make a stem cell. And so this is called reprogramming. And these cells are called induced pluripotent stem cells to distinguish them from the stem cells that you would isolate from an embryo. We have all kinds of ways of making sure that these cells really are stem cells. We can stain them for markers like Nanog and SSEA4 and TRA2, which are uh, these proteins that are only produced in these stem cells. We can also measure gene expression, which is actually what you see here uh, in the bottom uh, right-hand panel. Uh, and you can see, for example, that these IPS cells, which are, which are here, are actually uh, a little bit, uh, are very different from uh, progenitors or neurons or fibroblasts. So, so we can actually be very certain that these cells really are stem cells. Now, the next question is, can we convert these stem cells into neurons and how would we do that? And so it took us a very long time to actually try and figure this out. And what we've done is we've actually harnessed the very same pathways that are required to build the nervous system. So we start with these induced pluripotent stem cells and then these induced pluripotent stem cells over here uh, are then uh, converted into these things called embryoid bodies, which are these little aggregates. And these aggregates contain cells that form the initial three germ cells that are the basis of uh, all mammals. So they, this is ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. 
it turns out that uh, the nervous system is derived from ectoderm, and so we put them under conditions where you favor the growth of ectoderm. And at this point, they start forming these little circular structures called rosettes that look very much like the cross-section of the developing neural tube. And then we can take these rosettes and we can grow them as little spheres, and these are called brain, uh, and these are, these are organoids, and we can grow them for months in this way. And then uh, once these have reached a particular point in maturation, we can do one of two things. We can either dissociate them and have these sort of two-dimensional cultures that we can use to identify phenotypes, or alternatively, we can slice them and use them uh, like little chunks of brain. And so uh, when we do this, then, we can then generate cells that have n almost all the features of mature neurons. So one of the things we can look at, for example, is we can look at their ability to fire action potentials. And so in this case, we're actually looking at the increases in calcium in uh, these iPS-derived neurons, which is what you see here. And every time you see a cell go green, it's firing an action potential. And we do this just simply to show that these really are neurons. We've taken a skin cell, converted it into a stem cell, and taking that stem cell and made it into a neuron, which is kind of amazing, actually, that this can even be done. Right? Um, of course, the gold standard here is, is not just simply to look at calcium, but actually to be able to measure the electrical event inside the cell and to see if these cells actually fire action potentials. And in fact, you can do this. We've developed ways of labeling specific classes of neurons and actually recording from them. And they form, they, they have these beautiful action potentials, which are the signature of a neuron. We can also uh, have them form synapses uh, so that they form connections between different neurons. And we can actually measure these, uh, the, the uh, synaptic transmission between cells. Um, and then finally, we can take these cells and we can actually put them back into a mouse brain. Now, why would anybody want to do that? And, and the reason is that if you have a cellular defect in a human neuron, sometimes you want to make sure that when you give a drug to an organism, you can actually change that cellular defect in situ, that is to say, in a mouse brain. So we have these kind of chimeric mice that we can use to test our drugs. So um, the other thing we can do is we can generate these brain organoids. And we spent a lot of time trying to make sure that these brain organoids uh, look a little bit like a developing human brain. And so after about 60 days, they look approximately like an embryonic 12.5 uh, human uh, brain. So they're about the same size. Uh, we can actually uh, identify different structures. So in this case, for example, you can see this is a cross-section of one of these organoids. You can see that there's a ventricle, which is very sim similar to uh, a real brain. Uh, there, there is this germinal zone, which are these green neurons. And these are the, the, the cells that give rise to neurons. Uh, there are radial glial cells there that then guide the neurons to the outer part of the brain, which forms the cortex. And we can actually see layers of cortex. We can even measure uh, electrical events in these cells in situ, uh, much in the same way that people do this in the, uh, in, in the brain. Uh, now, finally, we can use these organoids to actually identify phenotypes that are associated with disease. In this case, for example, we have an organoid from uh, a, a patient that has tuberous sclerosis. And it, you can see that it has a very different kind of arrangement. So we can use, uh, so, so we, we now have this ability then to actually generate human neurons from people with disease. So uh, the final thing that is important it has been to automate the system to make it actually possible to use this for drug discovery. So when we first started doing this uh, about a decade ago, it would take a single individual three or four months to differentiate just one line. And oftentimes, uh, these lines would get contaminated. There was lots of variability. And so in order to make this really viable, we had to develop uh, robotic systems that would allow us to differentiate many, many lines at once and to generate enough neurons that our scientists could actually use them for drug discovery. So we have automated this IPSC platform using a robot that looks a bit like this. And this is a robot that essentially does uh, that, that differentiates the cells into neurons, it feeds the cells, it, uh, and it can do this for many, many lines at once. And so this allows us to do two things. First, we can generate human neurons for drug discovery projects. We can identify new phenotypes and targets, and then we can understand, use them to understand uh, 
many things, including polygenic disease. So for example, we can generate neurons from a whole series of schizophrenics and see if the neurons from somebody with schizophrenia are on average different than neurons from somebody without schizophrenia. We don't actually know if that's true, but this is the kind of experiment that we can do. So the final question then is once you've made neurons, can you actually identify uh, some sort of a phenotype that would allow you to uh, use this as a way to discover, discover new medicines for that disease? So can we actually do this? Uh, so I'm going to give you just uh, three examples of where we've done this and uh, being able to use it to develop new medicines. And, and the first example is a, a disease in a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, which is the most common genetic cause of infant death. It is an autosomal recessive disorder, which means that you need to have mutations in both copies of the gene that is mutated, which in this case is the SMN1 gene. And then uh, it is associated with this loss of alpha motor neurons, which are the motor neurons that control the movements of essentially all your muscles. It leads to muscle atrophy, disability, and eventually to death. And uh, it is quite common. So about 1 in 35 people in the West are carriers. About 1 in 6,000 uh, births result in SMA. And there are no therapies. It is a truly devastating disease. And we have worked on spinal muscular atrophy using both uh, stem cells as well as mouse models. So SMA is, is as I said, caused by this uh, homozygous mutation in SMN1 so that there is no functional SMN1 protein left. Now, fortunately, there's another gene called the SMN2 gene, which encodes for a protein that is identical to SMN1. So why don't we use SMN2? Well, we don't use SMN2 because it turns out that there's a point mutation in the SMN2 gene that means that it isn't properly spliced. So it's missing uh, an exon, which is exon 7, that doesn't get spliced properly. So only about 10% of the SMN2 messages are make real protein. The rest get degraded. So the question is, can we develop a drug that changes SMN2 such that it now produces SMN protein? And so to do this, we had to develop an assay that was amenable to high throughput screening. And so the way this was done was to uh, take, a, take the human SMN2 gene and at the very end add a coding sequence for luciferase, which as you may know is the light emitting enzyme from fireflies. And uh, this, this luciferase only gets produced properly if exon 7 gets included in the gene. Uh, it doesn't get, any, it doesn't get uh, produced if exon 7 is not produced. So under normal circumstances, you don't make very much luciferase. But when you add a compound that corrects this, you suddenly start making luciferase. So we screened 1.5 million compounds, and we got three hits. Now, normally, this is a failed screen. But the people who are working on this, uh, uh, Rajiv Sivasankaran, who is a very talented biologist in our group, uh, he uh, persevered. And together with a set of chemists, they took one of these molecules, they did a lot of medicinal chemistry, and then they eventually developed a molecule that dramatically improves the splicing of SMN2 so that it always includes exon 7. And so you can see more or less what that looks like down here. So uh, uh, again, just focus on uh, the, 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 the black line. You can see that as you add more and more of the compound, the black line rises because you're getting more and more of the full length product. Right? Uh, the red line is a control. And this is just simply showing you that uh, if you do it in the other direction, so if you, instead of having a gene that produces luciferase when exon 7 is included, you have a gene that produces luciferase when exon 7 is not included. As you add more compound, you have less of the gene that has the luciferase. Okay? So, what does this actually do to the SMN2 message in patient derived neurons? And so this is what you see here. As you add more and more of this compound that we call LMI, you get more and more full-length SMN2 RNA. This is in patient-derived neurons. And you also, as you see over here, you get more and more of the protein. Uh, you can actually do this even in the mouse brain, which, of course, is what you'd like to see. So again, you start dosing a mouse with increasing amounts of LMI. And the more you give, the more protein you see. And uh, this is why you see that these blue bars are getting higher and higher, because as you give more of the drug, you get more SMN protein. In this mouse that has the SMN2, uh, the human SMN2 gene, it's called the Delta-7 mouse. Now, these mice normally die, 
And again, you can see that right here, they, they, there are these lines that are going all the way to zero at around uh, you know, 20 days. But if you give them LMI, and you can sort of see this here, uh, at least half of the mice survive for as long as we can measure it. So this then, at least in the mouse model, has the capacity to uh, rescue the mice. And in the human neuron model, it has the capacity to dramatically increase the amount of SMN protein. So uh, what does LMI do? And again, this is very unusual. But first, we thought that it must bind to a protein, the way every other small molecule that is used as a drug does. But it turns out that it doesn't. It turns out that LMI actually binds to RNA. It binds to the pre-spliced message. Uh, and it also binds to an RNA that is used as part of the splicing machinery called the U1 SNR and PRNA. And it kind of bridges these two to allow splicing to happen more efficiently. Uh, we've now uh, progressed LMI into patients, uh, and these are babies with type 1 SMA. And what you see here is something called the CHOP and 10 scale, which is a kind of neurological exam for babies. And all of these babies are born with a very low CHOP and 10 score, and over time it just gets worse unless it's treated. Uh, what you see here is that while it's not true in every patient, in a substantial fraction of the patients as we give them uh, LMI, you see an increase in their CHOP and 10 score. Uh, and we're sort of cautiously optimistic that this might actually be, be beneficial for this population of patients. Okay, I'm going to talk about another disease now. This is something called Timothy syndrome. So Timothy syndrome is uh, associated with cutaneous syndactyly, uh, hypoglycemia, autism, and cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, we were interested in it because it's associated with autism and cardiac arrhythmia, and we don't know very much about these diseases. Uh, it is caused by a mutation in a voltage-gated calcium channel called CAV1.2, and this is a protein that allows calcium into cells. In, and so the mutation changes the way in which the channel works. So again, for those of you who are not electrophysiologists, uh, uh, in the, in, you can see that normally this channel opens and then it closes over time. This is called an activation. And this mutation, this glycine for arginine mutation, actually results in a channel that stays open all the time. And so the question is, how does this lead both to cardiac arrhythmia and to autism? And so uh, there are two ways in which you might do this. So one of the things we did is we made neurons from these kids, and we started to see whether there were any defects in the neurons. So one approach you could take is you could say, OK, what does CAV, what does this voltage-gated calcium channel normally do during development? And one of the things it does is that it regulates the growth of the dendritic arbor in a neuron. And so, uh, and it does it in an activity-dependent way. So we had to develop an assay for looking at this growth in dendritic arbors. And so one way of doing this is to introduce into the neuron a light-activated ion channel and to uh, look to trigger electrical activity by stimulating the cells with blue light. And so when you, when you do this, every time you illuminate the cell, it fires all these action potentials. And then you can generate these movies that allow you to look at the extension or the retraction of every dendrite. And then we can use automated software to analyze every one of these, these dendrites. And so what we found was that if you looked at uh, cells from healthy controls, there was an increase in the dendritic arbor over time. So this is the blue curve, right? And if you looked at the cells from Timothy patients, there was actually a decrease. And so this told us then that this channel was somehow working in a different way. So um, we've learned a lot, and I, sh I, I won't go through all of it, about how exactly this happens. But one of the things that this allowed us to do was it allowed us to use this as a way uh, of looking for small molecules that might actually uh, rescue this cellular phenotype. And so this is a, a graph where we're showing the change in dendrites uh, as uh, in cells treated with various compounds. And so on, on the left is sort of the positive control. So these are cells from healthy individuals. And you can see that there's an increase in the dendrite length over time. Uh, and the red dots are one time point. The blue dots are another time point. 
Uh, and then in the next panel, you can see that there are, are that there's actually a decrease, a retraction of the dendrites. And then we can treat the cells with a whole set of compounds, a compound library, and then we can look for things that rescue this defect in Timothy cells. And so, uh, as you can see here, for example, the vast majority of compounds do nothing, but a small, small fraction of the compounds actually restore dendritic growth. One of them is this compound called roscovitin, uh, and we've learned a lot about how roscovitin works, and at least one of the ways in which it works is that it seems to actually rescue the gating defect in that calcium channel, which you remember doesn't inactivate very well, it stays on, it actually allows that calcium channel to close. So the other approach you could use is an unbiased approach. You, you could take these cells from patients and you can compare them to cells from healthy controls, and you can see which sets of genes are regulated differentially. And so uh, one approach to that is uh, to essentially measure the genes using uh, microarrays or RNA sequencing. So we've done this. And so in red, you see all the genes that are upregulated, and in blue, you see all the genes that are downregulated. Now, among these genes, you can look for ones that seem to be parts of similar pathways. And so among the little modules that we identified uh, was a set of genes that are important for the production of catecholamines. So catecholamines are dopamine and norepinephrine, and these are really important neurotransmitters that regulate uh, fight or flight responses, that regulate reward, that regulate attention. And so it seemed as if these genes were upregulated in patients. And so we looked to see if those, that those genes that were upregulated also resulted in an increase in the activity of the pathways that make these neurotransmitters. And we did this by measuring tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in the production of these neurotransmitters. And so what you see here is that on the, on the left, you have a healthy control, and on the right, you have a patient with Timothy syndrome. And so you see many, many more of these yellow cells, and these are cells that have increased tyrosine hydroxylase. Um, in fact, this is true not only of one patient with Timothy syndrome, this is true of all the patients we looked at. And uh, not only was it true of, of all the patients, we could actually show that these cells produce much more norepinephrine and a little bit more dopamine. Uh, and then finally, uh, we could show that this compound that we had discovered that reversed the dendritic arborization phenotype that actually uh, prevented retraction also could prevent the cells from overproducing tyrosine hydroxylase. And this was important because it told us that it wasn't as if these cells had somehow become a different kind of cell. It was simply that they were overproducing the set of genes that are normally required to make this neurotransmitter. So this is called ectopic expression. So, okay, so finally, uh, we wanted to understand how it was that uh, this mutation, this Timothy mutation, could uh, cause cardiac arrhythmias. And so we had made a mouse, actually, that had the Timothy mutation, and we were a little disappointed because the mouse had no cardiac phenotype. And uh, it turns out that that's not entirely surprising because the mouse heartbeat is around 500 beats per minute, and uh, the human heartbeat is around 60 beats per minute. And so there are many uh, mutations that just don't affect the mouse heartbeat uh, in the same way that, the, that they affect the human heartbeat. So we decided to make uh, human cardiomyocytes, and the first thing we did is we made some cardiomyocytes from healthy controls. These are the wild types, and you can see that the, these cardiomyocytes beat beautifully. In fact, we were greatly relieved that they beat at around 60 beats per minute. Uh, and then uh, we made human cardiomyocytes from Timothy patients. And when we did this, we found that uh, they beat much more slowly, and it's still going on, but you, you see, that... and further, that they kind of stutter. Uh, and so you can sort of see this here, right, that there are, uh, in, in, in the controls, they're all beating nice and uniformly, but in the Timothy patients, sometimes they have little double beats, sometimes they miss beats altogether like here, for example, and there. So, uh, so this then told us that there was sort of a defect. In fact, we could also go in there and actually measure the inward calcium currents, which are required for the contraction, and show that the patients in, in red here have much bigger currents, and therefore they have much longer uh, action potentials during each contraction, contraction cycle, and uh, that this results in uh, these little, these little events called delayed after depolarizations that people have associated with cardiac arrhythmias. So uh, again, this provided a cellular phenotype for what is actually a phenotype in the patients.
Okay, I'm going to finish by telling you uh, a little bit about one final disease we've worked on. This is something called Philip McDermott syndrome. Uh, it's associated with neonatal hypotonia, which is sort of floppiness, global developmental delay, uh, absent or severely delayed speech, and it is caused by a mutation on chromosome 22 uh, at the very end of the chromosome, a region called Q13, and uh, it is normally associated with the deletion of a large number of genes. Among the genes in that region is one gene called Shank3, and Shank3 is a protein that acts as a glue at synapses. It's usually found in the postsynaptic uh, density, and it's important because it binds to a large number of uh, ion channels and receptors that are found in that part of the cell. And uh, so we made neurons from these, from these kids, we uh, then had to develop a way to see if there was some defect in the function of synapses. And so that required two things. That required, uh, you know, we had to develop a synaptic assay. And we rapidly discovered, for example, that if we plated control cells and Philip McDermott cells in different wells, uh, it was very difficult to get reliable data. And so eventually we found that if we could plate them together, we could actually measure control cells and patient cells in the same well at the same time, which was important. Uh, and we could do identify patient cells or control cells by labeling them with different colored proteins. And um, so the first thing we found is that when we measured the synaptic events, and, and again, you can see this here. Uh, so over here, you see uh, both the control patients, and you can see that there are these big uh, deflections, and these are currents associated with synaptic transmission. And in Philip McDermott patients, they're much, much smaller. And uh, in fact, you can do this uh, over many different input voltages. And when you do that, you can see that there is, at every input voltage, the red little circles are smaller than the gray squares. And this tells you that there is, in fact, less activation of one class of synaptic, trans uh, synaptic uh, neurotransmitter receptor, the AMPA receptors. And uh, in fact, there is also a fairly severe defect in NMDA receptor currents, which you see over here. So, so the next question is, is this really due to just a defect in Shank3? Because remember that I told you there are many genes that are deleted here. And so to do that, we actually have to restore Shank3 to these cells. And so when we did this, we could actually show that there is an increase in the firing of, uh, an increase in the postsynaptic events, that is to say, in the synaptic transmission. Uh, and you can see this in both of these panels. Again, you see more of these like single events, uh, as well as a much bigger postsynaptic response when you actually evoke it. Uh, and then the final question is, is there some sort of molecule? Is there something? Is there some growth factor? And so we looked through the literature, and we looked to see what people had reported had uh, was uh, important for uh, the formation of synapses. And one of the, we tested many things, but one of the things that had been reported is that a growth factor called insulin uh, like growth factor one uh, could increase the number of synapses in uh, a number of different uh, mouse models. And so we looked to see if we added IGF-1 to these cells, could we restore synaptic transmission? And so uh, in fact, what we showed is that if you treated the cells with IGF-1 for about 48 hours, you could see both an increase in the number of these spontaneous events, and you could also see an increase in the number in the size of this kind of evoked response over here. Um, so, um, so then that suggested that IGF-1 was a, a, a possible, uh, a possible, uh, I wouldn't say treatment, but a, a way of reversing the phenotype in the patient. Um, the question is why? Why does IGF-1 work at all? And uh, so to do this, we actually uh, did an experiment where we looked at the activation of many different signaling pathways by looking at which proteins were phosphorylated. So many of you may know that phosphorylation is a common way in which information is transduced from the outside of a cell to the inside of a cell. It's a common uh, modification that uh, is, is used for signal transduction. And so we looked at all the proteins that were phosphorylated in patient cells compared to control cells. And so what, what you see here is uh, a comparison of healthy of cells from healthy controls and health cells from Philip McDermott patients. So uh, on, you know, so as it, the dots that are uh, below the sort of zero line are represent peptides that are under phosphorylated in patients relative to controls, 
and the ones that are above the zero line represent ones that are more phosphorylated. So what, what we noticed was that there were a series of proteins that were misphosphorylated that seemed to fit into a particular pathway. And specifically, they fit into this pathway that is regulated by this uh, kinase called AKT, uh, and that eventually lead to activation uh, of, of another kinase called mTOR. And it turns out that these are downstream of the insulin-like growth factor receptor. So uh, this has been extremely useful because it uh, tells us uh, a lot about how this insulin-like growth factor actually signals in cells and why it might be effective in these patients. Uh, I should say that uh, the idea that uh, insulin-like growth factor might be effective in these patients has actually been tested clinically by Joe Buxbaum and his colleagues, and uh, they have found that, uh, and again, this is in a very small trial, but they found that when they measured, for example, social withdrawal, which is uh, one of the ways of measuring one of the, uh, the, the impairments in autism, uh, there was a decrease in social withdrawal, which you see in the blue, uh, and the blue bars relative to uh, patients that were in patients treated with insulin-like growth factor uh, relative to uh, patients treated with a placebo. This is a small study, and so hopefully it will reproduce when it's done on a bigger scale. So let me just finish by just touching a little bit on the final thing that I think we need to improve, uh, which is I think that in addition to improving uh, our selection of targets and diseases, and in addition to improving how we model these things preclinically, we also have to think about how we improve our clinical trials. And uh, there are at least three things we have to do. The first thing is that we have to uh, think about stratifying patients according to their genetics and their pathophysiology and not their behavior. And so this means that we are probably going to be developing uh, more effective medicines, but for smaller numbers of people. The second, uh, issue is that we need to think about how do we, we develop new endpoints. Again, we're uh, measuring these very soft endpoints like cognition and mood, and we need to find ways of measuring them on a continuous basis in real life using phones and watches and other gadgets. And I think this is well within our capacity to do this over the next few years. And then finally, uh, we need to think about how we implement methods of uh, evaluating, of, of, of collecting some of these endpoints in an objective way to reduce the placebo response. And again, there are a, a number of ways in which we can evaluate individual improvement in ways that help us eliminate the sort of spurious effects of an observer or the spurious effects of somebody coming into a facility to be evaluated. So where are we now? Uh, so you may have seen this. This is Gardner's cycle of innovation. And this is true of every new technology, including the induced pluripotent stem cell technology that I've talked about. And so normally there's a technology trigger, and then this is followed by this peak of inflated expectations where whatever technology is going to solve every problem. And then a few years after that, it becomes clear that all those promises are not going to be met, at least not as quickly as people thought. This is what is called the trough of disillusionment. And then very gently, one emerges from the trough of disillusionment to what I describe as a slope of enlightenment. And I think uh, this is sort of where we are now. Uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, I think that we can make neurons. We can make human neurons from individuals with neurological and psychiatric diseases. We can identify defects in these neurons, and this is, you know, we've come a long way in that sense. We can identify compounds that reverse some of these defects. Um, you know, at the same time, there are some clear limitations. Uh, human neurons are clearly imperfect models of human disease. This is best for things that are cell, for, for defects that are cell autonomous, not so good for things that reflect defects in circuitry. Uh, and the cellular phenotypes that we observe uh, may in fact not cause the disease. But as I've shown you in a few examples, we're starting to get some inklings that the uh, defects that we observe in these human neurons actually reflect what is happening in a human uh, brain. And if we correct them, we have this ability to actually treat patients with these serious disabling diseases. So let me finish by thanking uh, all the people who made all of this work possible. Uh, I, of course, often say we, and I mean them, and this is them. Uh, none of this would be possible without the fantastic uh, group of people at uh, Novartis who make all of this stuff happen. And, of course, my lab at Stanford who also made major contributions to this. So, thank you.